We have a couple of announcements uh, or housekeeping uh, before we get started this morning on scientific session number seven. Um, the, to claim CME, uh, it's in the meeting app or online, and you need to do that before October 3rd. Um, check back in the meeting app later this week uh, to enjoy recordings of the meeting and uh, relive the experience here at Southwest Surgical from 2021. And uh, we also want to say safe travels home. Uh, please make plans next year uh, for Phoenix at the Wigwam. Uh, Southwest Surgical uh, 2022 annual meeting will be April 24th through the 7th, 27th. So make plans now. And actually the abstract uh, is um, open now and closing of the abstract submissions will be November um, 1st, I believe. So the, the first uh, paper of this session is Rurality and uh, Paradoxically Associated with Shorter Length of Stay, Status Post Colectomy for Colon Cancer from the University of uh, Nebraska Medical Center. Dr. Lam, uh, Leon, Rodriguez, or Armejo, Chodstrom, Anderson, Kothari, and Olitnikov. And do we have our presenter? Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, I'd just like to thank everybody at UNMC who's involved with this research, and I'd like to thank everybody at the Southwestern Surgical Congress who allowed me to speak today. The title of our research is Morality Paradoxically Associated with Shorter Length of Stay Status Post Colectomy for Colon Cancer. I have no conflicts of interest nor financial disclosures. Uh, so for some background, 34% of Nebraska's population is non-metropolitan compared to 14% of the U.S. population. Disparities in colon cancer screening and access to care exist in non-metropolitan Nebraska. Uh, minimally invasive surgery is less frequently utilized in rural Nebraska compared to urban Nebraska. And large database studies have shown that MIS, including colectomy, may result in fewer complications, shorter length of stay, and decreased mortality compared to open surgery. Uh, this is a map of the 93 Nebraska counties. Uh, for the purpose of research, the most common way to define, ur define urban and rural is to break counties down into metropolitan and non-metropolitan as determined by the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, metropolitan counties contain a city of greater than 50,000 people, or they have significant commute to a city of that size. Uh, non-metropolitan counties are divided into micropolitan and non-core. Uh, non-core patient, non-core counties, excuse me, are the smaller of the three groups, and uh, they have less than 10,000 people in a core urban area and no significant commute to either of the larger county classes. Uh, there are three cities in Nebraska with greater than 50,000 people. There are 12 metropolitan counties and uh, 64 out of the 93 counties in Nebraska are classified as non-core, the smallest of the three groups. So our objective was to determine if patient morality impacted 30-day readmission rate or length of stay for Nebraskans with primary colon cancer undergoing colon resection. Uh, we hypothesized that non-metropolitan patients would have an increased length of stay and increased 30-day readmission rate compared to metropolitan patients. The database we used was the Nebraska Hospital Information System database. Uh, this is an administrative database, and all hospitals in Nebraska are required by law to report all patient encounters to this database. Um, in addition to demographics and comorbidities, the NHIS um, uniquely contains data for patient zip code and hospital zip code. And uh, we were the first group to be approved to use this database for clinical research. Um, so we included Nebraska residents with primary colon cancer who underwent colon resection and were greater than 19 years old. And we excluded patients with rectal cancer or metastatic disease to or from the colon. Um, we found that non-metropolitan patients were older than metropolitan patients. They had more cardiac disease, diabetes, and more total comorbidities. Uh, they also underwent a higher percentage of open surgeries. Uh, Non-core patients specifically traveled a median of 42.7 miles for surgery, which was far greater than the other two groups. Uh, the other two groups were less than seven miles per median. Uh, and metropolitan and micropolitan patients went to hospitals within their own respective county classes, whereas non-core patients um, went to metropolitan, micropolitan, and non-core uh, hospitals more evenly. Uh, the two variables that were independently associated with increased 30-day readmission rate were increased length of stay and incidence of cardiac disease. Uh, the 30-day readmission rate was the same across hospital and patient county class. Um, these are the variables that were independently associated with increased length of stay. Uh, as you can see, patient county class was one of those variables. 
Importantly, hospital county class was not associated with length of stay. Uh, these are the corrected length of stays for um, different patient county classes. As you can see, the, the metropolitan patients actually had the longest length of stays and the non-core patients actually had the shortest length of stay, which was really surprising to us. Um, and it was more than half a day. And so, you know, these, these were uh, statistically significant, but I included the, the uncorrected data um, just to kind of show that, you know, it might also be clinically significant because even uncorrected for, for other variables, the metropolitan patients had a longer length of stay than the non-core patients by over half a day. Um, then we did a subset analysis of patients who only went to a metropolitan hospital, and we found basically the exact same data. Um, for this subset of patients, <clears throat> metropolitan patients had almost a, a, an entire day longer length of stay than the non-core patients. So in summary, rural patients were older, they had more comorbidities, and they were more likely to undergo open surgery. Um, there was no difference in 30-day readmission rate between patient nor hospital county classes. And unexpectedly, length of stay was actually the shortest for the rural patients. Um, so, you know, the, the shorter length of stay for rural patients is counterintuitive because many of these patients travel long distances. Uh, my anecdotal experience is that surgeons will be extra careful uh, before discharging a rural patient so that they don't end up going back to a, 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 rural air, a rural area with decreased access to surgical care and risk complications. Um, so we were struggling to figure out why rural patients spent less time in the hospital. And um, I'm actually from rural Nebraska, and I've spent some time talking to people back home about this study. Um, and the only thing that I can think of really is that the attitude and beliefs of rural Nebraskans towards hospitalization is simply different than those of urban patients. Um, if anybody has any other ideas, please, I'd be happy to listen. Um, and then, you know, the other question is, why does this matter? So, you know, county class could potentially be a, compo a confounding variable in any study that measures length of stay. Uh, one example that comes to mind is minimally invasive surgery. So many studies have shown that, that uh, there's an advantage of minimally invasive surgery on decreased recovery time and shorter length of stay when compared to open surgery. However, uh, in our study, you know, we saw that rural patients had a higher percentage of open surgery and they still had a shorter length of stay even with the raw data. So the, the benefit um, of, of minimally invasive surgery might actually be stronger than it appears because if a, a database or a study is unable to classify patients by rurality, then uh, the benefit of minimally invasive surgery might be obscured by the tendencies of rural patients to leave the hospital sooner. Um, and then the next steps for us, for us are to explore the cause of decreased length of stay for non-metro patients, um, to determine how the results of this study might impact the results of other studies, and to expand the use of the NHIS uh, to identify potential disparities in the health of Nebraskans. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody have a question? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Thank you very much. Uh, this paper will be discussed by Dr. Constantinidis from Texas Tech to El Paso. Thank you very much. Um, a nice presentation, Dr. Lam. I, I enjoy it, and thanks for returning your manuscript on time. Um, there is a lot of literature about uh, tra uh, distance traveled and outcomes after complex uh, cancer surgery. And uh, we know well that uh, after uh, complex surgeries like pancreas, esophageal, um, and uh, also uh, rectal, uh, traveling distance uh, usually associated with better outcomes. And that happens usually because uh, there is a high volume institution or more than more than a high volume institution that has uh, better outcomes compared to uh, lower or intermediate volume institutions. So for example, there is a very recent paper in the Annals of Surgery using the National Cancer Database and the uh, pancreas, esophageal, and rectal resections. Uh, I noticed that the length of stay was not different between the rural and uh, urban hospitals in your study. Can you comment a little bit on hospital volume? And maybe uh, I noticed that you only used one year, 2017. Did you consider expanding 
your data. Uh, I mean, 400 patients for an administrative database is still a small number. That will be my first question, please. Yeah, uh, so let me make sure I understood that question correctly. Uh, so you said for the difference between which groups of patients, I'm sorry. So first is hospital volume. Were mm -hmm. you able to uh, differentiate the hospitals into high intermediate volume and low volume hospitals and see uh, if this could give you uh, some explanation why there was no difference between rural and urban hospitals? Sure. Um, yeah, we did not do that in our study. Um, we have access to the hospital zip codes. Um, so we, what we did was we classified pay, uh, the hospitals based on their county class, uh, metropolitan, non-core, and micropolitan. Um, if we wanted to class, uh, classify hospitals by volume, uh, we, we technically could. We would have to uh, find those hospitals. Um, I think we actually have access to the hospitals' names themselves with this database. Um, which is pretty unique. So we would have to kind of manually um, find those stats of hospital volume um, by ourselves. And then we could uh, potentially do that in this study or in with this database, but we didn't do that with this study. Okay, that might be a good idea because again, most of the, pa of the papers that shows uh, traveling distance and outcomes, it's the volume of the hospital that makes the big difference. Now, I noticed in this cohort, only, almost 60% of patients were, uh, of cases were open. And mm -hmm. not surprisingly, the length of stay was more than five days. So that's not what we see nowadays. For example, a recent paper from Nisquip shows that over 80% of their elective colectomies were either ROB or uh, laparoscopic. I was wondering, what's the reason of having a cohort of predominantly open surgeries and do you have any uh, idea if this were elective versus emergent colectomies? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know if these were elective or emergent. Uh, we didn't make that distinction. Um, so, but yeah, I, I agreed. I thought that the, that the 60% open surgery rate was surprising. Um, it was 50 Three percent, I think, is what it was for the for the the metropolitan patients. So it was uh, more minimally invasive surgery for the metropolitan patients. But even then, the fifty percent um, was still a little bit surprising. Uh, we had, you know, the 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 patients that we selected, um, the they had surgeries between two thousand twelve and two thousand nineteen. Um, I wonder that study that you cite um, was that kind of within that same time frame. Well, um, you mean the National Cancer Database? All these are modern studies. I think laparoscopic colectomies have been around even since I was a resident. So sure, uh, yeah. you look 2015, 16, or 2021, sure. maybe you're going to see only the robots uh, increasing. Uh, but sure. uh, uh, most of the cases are, are now being done minimally invasive. Mm -hmm. um, my, found, my last comment is, of course, we are as good as our data. And when you don't have data on complications and mortality, it's very difficult to explain uh, your findings. I was wondering if you have any data on readmission of these patients to non-index hospitals. For example, is this uh, possible that rural patients get readmitted more often, but we don't see it in this data set because they get readmitted closer to home? Do you have any data on readmissions? Sure. So we do, there is a flag in this database that can, uh, it can, it can allow us to see where they're readmitted. Um, we didn't use it. So we don't know with this study specifically, um, whether they were readmitted to an index hospital or, the, or a non-index hospital. Um, however, any patient that is readmitted within the state of Nebraska um, would have been picked up by our study. So if, if uh, you know, say they were at University of Nebraska Medical Center and they went back and uh, had a readmission in their smaller town, um, that would have been picked up in our study. We just wouldn't have noted that it was a readmission to a non-index hospital specifically. Okay, very good. Thanks, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you very much.
the next paper is uh, early liposomal bupivacaine blocks improved analgesia uh, and decrease uh, opioid requirements for bariatric surgery patients uh, presented by Dr. Alexis uh, Crowley of uh, Denver Health Medical Center. Thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to present here today. I have nothing to disclose. Denver Health uses liposomal bupivacaine for local regional anesthesia in select patient groups. This medication was approved by the FDA in 2012 and is indicated for single dose infiltration to provide post-surgical local anesthesia for regional anesthesia. The suspension contains microvesicular liposomes. It's mixed with normal saline and free bupivacaine. The liposomes are composed of multiple layers of phospholipid membranes. And as those membranes degrade slowly over time, it releases the free bupivacaine and this results in effective pain control for up to 72 hours. We began using liposomal bupivacaine in our transversus abdominis plane blocks in our bariatric patients in 2019. Initially, we provided the laparoscopic assisted tap blocks at the conclusion of our bariatric cases. We then switched to the beginning of the case and this was to provide preemptive anesthesia Preemptive anesthesia is defined as pharmacological intervention that is initiated prior to a painful stimulus. It serves to inhibit the nociceptive mechanisms before they are triggered. The concept states that prolonged pain signals on the neuron receptors lead to an upregulation in responsiveness of that neuron. This results in amplification of those pain signals and ultimately peripheral and central sensitization of the pain signals. This then causes a continued perception of pain that lasts beyond the stimuli and it leads to hypersensitivity and a risk of chronic pain. Providing anesthesia before the stimulus prevents the sensitization process and that limits the risk of hypersensitivity and the development of chronic pain. Encouraged by this concept, we hypothesize that providing liposomal bupivacaine tap blocks to our bariatric surgeries at the start of the case would be associated with reduced post-operative opiate requirements compared to patients who receive the tap blocks immediately after their surgery. Our bariatric center is a MISQIP accredited center that maintains a prospective quality improvement database. Utilizing this database, we performed a retrospective review of consecutive patients who received the lipo liposomal bupivacal tap blocks performed from February 2019 through August 2020. Patients who underwent surgery prior to November 13th received their tap blocks at the conclusion of the case. Those patients who underwent surgery after November 13th received their tap blocks immediately after laparoscopic access. All patients received the same standard post-operative care during this period. We, we utilize a one-to-one -one mixed solution of free bupivacaine with the liposom liposomal bupivacaine solution. Our database is composed of basic demographic information, surgical details, and post-operative details. For a primary outcome evaluating narcotic requirements, doses were converted to morphine milligram equivalents and they were treated as continuous variables and analyzed using Students T or Man Whitney U. For our categorical variables such as length of stay and maximum pain scores, they were treated as uh, categorical variables and we looked at chi-square or Fisher's comparison. Our univariate analysis showed that the groups were similar in terms of age, race, BMI, and the proportion of patients who endorsed a history of chronic pain. The beginning tap group was composed of a greater proportion of patients with Hispanic ethnicity. The types of bariatric surgeries remained similar between the groups, with most patients undergoing Wu and Y surgeries and a few requiring hiatal hernia repairs. Operation times were also similar between the groups. For our secondary outcomes, we found no differences in the maximum daily pain scores that patients reported during their hospital stay. Standard of care protocol is to discharge our patients on post-op day two. A similar proportion of patients required an extra stay for each group. There is no difference in the proportion of patients who sought post-operative pain control in the emergency department after discharge. We were interested in evaluating the opiate requirements by looking at the doses per day to get some granular data, as well as totals. On post-op day zero, all patients received IV hydromorphone as needed. The beginning TAP group received statistically less IV hydromorphone on this day. On post-op day one, patients can receive IV or oral hydromorphone. We had no differences in either formulation on this day. On post-op day two, patients received only oral hydromorphone. In the beginning TAP group, the patients received half as much. The inpatient totals for all three days show that the beginning TAP group received approximately 30 milligrams of morphine less than the end TAP group. 
Additionally, the discharge oxycodone prescriptions were smaller in the beginning tap group. When you add up the total morphine equivalents following the surgery, the beginning tap group was prescribed a total of 55 milligrams of morphine less than the end tap group. Interestingly, the largest statistically significant reductions in opiate consumption occurred on the day of operation and at discharge. The differences seen immediately post-operative can be explained by the earlier administration of the bupivacaine solution, providing extra time for that medication to take effect. The decreased narcotic requirements later in the hospital course around 72 hours post-op day two, this supports the concept that preemptive anesthesia did decrease the hypersensitivity and risk of chronic pain following our surgical insult. A limitation of this study is that we changed our practice over time, and this was during a time when all providers were cognizant of the amount of opiates they described during this opiate epidemic. Additionally, patients and providers are not blinded to the narcotic doses that were prescribed. And those who required less doses immediately after surgery might have been viewed as having a greater, um, high, greater pain tolerance and were prescribed less or sought less opiates after surgery. In conclusion, we have shown that earlier administration of liposomal bupivacaine tap blocks as a preemptive anesthesia instead of postoperative administration is associated with decreased immediate postoperative narcotic requirements and ultimately lower narcotic usage through discharge. This transition to administer tap blocks at the beginning of surgery is an easy, no cost solution to decrease narcotic usage in our bariatric patients. And we recommend the shift to preemptive administration until larger prospective trials can provide further data. Thank you. Invited the discussant for this page, paper is uh, President, uh, now President, Shanu Kathari <laughs> from Prism Health. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to congratulate the authors on their work and allowing me to discuss this timely paper as ERAS has become the mainstay in the field of bariatric surgery. They performed a single institution analysis, of timing of tap blocks, and noted a decrease in morphine equivalents if the block was performed at the beginning of the case as opposed to the end of the case. I think we can all agree that reduction in opioids should be one of the goals of any ERAS protocol, but the value of tap blocks in the literature is highly variable. I think this is because of differences in drugs, dosages, type of block, as well as timing as the, uh, of the block, as the authors suggest. To that end, I have several questions regarding your technique that was not available in the initial manuscript. Uh, did you close any of your larger port sites with a suture passer? And if so, do you think this impacted your post-operative pain scores? Was this the four quadrant technique and how many CCs did you use in each quadrant? We know that preperitoneal infiltration should be avoided, often seen as the rippling bleb, and that that is a visual cue to pull the needle back. But do you have any tips on to know that the drug is actually being placed between the internal oblique and transversus abdominis muscle plane. How do you explain the lower number of pain pills at discharge? Is the number tailored to how the patient did during the hospitalization or could this simply have been a change in your discharge protocol? And any tips on getting long acting liposomal bupivacaine on the shelf at health systems that have deemed it cost prohibitive? And finally, if your data supports tap blocks prior to incision, your technique requires the laparoscope to be placed prior. What are your thoughts on ultrasound guided tap blocks prior to any incision? Thank you for your contribution to the literature and allowing me to be the discussant. Thank you for the questions. Um, I'm not 100% familiar with the exact surgical method we use. I can't comment on whether it was a four quadrant or not. I do know that they place the ports and then we immediately prescribe the liposomal bupivacaine under direct visual um, visualization. I do not know if we previously did ultrasound guided um, anesthesia. My understanding is we've never done that because we prefer to administer the blocks ourselves and not include the anesthesia team. Um, what was the other question? Pain pills at discharge. Mm, did you yes. eyeball the patient and look at how much they were using and tailor the amount or did you just switch from, because your average went from like 20 to 15 um, at discharge, or is that just a change in your EHR template for discharge? Yes, we discussed that as if this was part of our transition to do lower 
opioid discharge prescriptions. Our discharge prescriptions are managed by a nurse practitioner who runs this entire service. She said that she hasn't really changed her practice at all in describing different ones. But of course, over time, and this is over a year long study, that, that could have occurred without us really trying to do that. And then there's pres pills prescribed and pills taken. Obviously, we've learned a lot about that at uh, this week here as well. And so you probably didn't follow up with the patient to ask them how many they actually took upon discharge. We did not. We talked about um, including that in future databases, not only asking if patients took all of the pain pills they were described, but also asking if they were prescribed any more by providers who are outside of our database. Our EMR allows us to see a few additional hospitals if they were to go to an ER outside of ours, but we wouldn't be able to see um, primary care providers outside of our hospital. Any comments on the cost? Many of us are envious because we can't get this. This uh, is prohibitive from uh, pharmacy and therapeutics committee. How did you crack that code? Um, so I believe Dr. Prachi cracked that code. He initially wanted to prescribe liposomal bupivacaine to our rib fracture patients, and he did so by discussing the cost with pharmacy and saying that this was for study use only initially, and his initial rib fracture paper showed that we had a better pain control when we switched from using pain catheters in our rib fracture patients to using Exprel. And so he was able to show that with our improved outcomes with Exprel, the pharmacy allowed us to have a greater use of that product. Thank you. Thanks, Vitaly. Uh, Vitaly here from Texas Tech. I'm a resident there. Just had a question because it seems like your hospital uses liposomal uh, bupivacaine uh, often. We at our hospital actually started putting a bracelet on those patients because we had a couple of cases of uh, lidocaine overdose because that lidocaine keeps getting you know, uh, released over the couple of days. And if they get liking from another source, uh, the provider has to be aware of that. Does, does your hospital have any sort of system like that to track these patients? Or have you had any cases of lidocaine overdose? Not that I know of, and I don't believe we have a system to track these patients. Um, the patients who do receive liposomal bupivacaine are usually on either the bariatric service or the trauma service with rib fractures. So we have the same providers who are monitoring them and are familiar with the medication. Thank you. Another question? No. Thank you very much. The next three papers are uh, Jack Barney Award um, uh, papers, uh, competition papers, and they'll be introduced by my co-moderator, Dr. Morgan Bonds uh, from the University of Oklahoma in Oklahoma City. All right. Thank you, Dr. Albrecht. So our next presentation will be virtual. It is a 40-year experience with hyperthermic isolated limb perfusion. Uh, it will be presented by Dr. Liebshire from the University of Kansas School of Medicine. I'm Sean Liebscher. I'm a general surgery resident at the University of Kansas Hospital. Uh, I wanted to start by thanking the Southwestern Surgical Congress on behalf of myself and Dr. Malman for the opportunity to present the 40-year experience at our institution with hypothermic isolated limb perfusion. I've been hoping to attend the meeting in person, but my son decided this past week that 35 weeks was long enough and that he was ready to join our family a little bit early. Uh, unfortunately, I had a brief stop over in the NICU, uh, but I'm thankful for the chance to join the meeting at least virtually. Neither myself nor Dr. Mahman have anything to disclose. The development of effective systemic therapies has led to significant improvements in the treatment of melanoma and soft tissue sarcoma detected early in the disease course. Advanced local regional disease, however, has remained challenging to treat effectively, with between 65 and 85% of patients experiencing disease recurrence within three years. Additionally, many patients desire to explore all possible limb salvage strategies. To this end, limb perfusion has been utilized for greater than five decades for the treatment of advanced melanoma confined to an extremity, and for more than two decades for the treatment of locally advanced soft tissue sarcomas confined to an extremity. Over the past several decades, there have been many improvements in the techniques utilized for limb perfusion, including standardizations of surgical strategy, duration of limb perfusion, temperature of limb perfusion, chemotherapeutic drug selection, and postoperative care. In this study, we examined the limb perfusion experience at our academic medical center over the past 41 years, looking at both the contemporary results as well as changes in length of stay and survival during this period. Uh, this picture here is an example of a typical lower extremity limb perfusion setup, in this case, a left lower extremity. 
Uh, after groin exposure, the artery and the vein are cannulated, typically with 14 French cannulas. An s mark tourniquet is placed and the limb is isolated on pump. Uh, we perform a leak test with radio label to prevent blood cells to ensure that no uh, blood is leaking out of the leg. And as long as there's no evidence of a systemic leak, the temperature is increased to the target temperature and chemotherapy started. After the duration of the perfusion uh, and the conclusion, the chemotherapy is removed, the leg is washed out with several liters of fluid and blood returned to the body. The vessels are decannulated and the groins closed. For our experience, we examined previously collected institutional data of 85 patients from 1980 to 2009, and also looked at a prospectively collected database of 69 patients from 2009 to 2001 who underwent limb perfusion for melanoma, soft tissue sarcoma, angiosarcoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and Merkel cell carcinoma, for a total of 154 patients. Length of stay and length of ICU stay was compared across each decade for all of these patients. We then specifically looked at the subset of patients treated for melanoma, which were divided into two cohorts by date of surgery, with the first cohort spanning from 1980 to 2012 and the second cohort spanning from 2013 to 2021. We selected this cut point for comparison due to the formalization of uh, the limb perfusion technique at our institution, as well as the introduction of effective systemic therapies for melanoma around this time frame. The second cohort is also notable since a single surgical oncologist and two vascular surgeons were involved in all the limb perfusions in this group. Fortunately, due to limitations in data for patients prior to 2009, we were not able to compare the demographics and comorbidities between the two cohorts. For the patients who underwent limb perfusion, the majority of them, 93%, were treated for melanoma, with 3% being treated for Merkel cell, 2% for angiosarcoma, and about 1.5% for squamous cell and soft tissue sarcomas. Of the 56% patients who were in the uh, later cohort, the number of males and females were evenly matched with 28 in each group, and the average age of patients was younger in the initial cohort with 57 years of age compared to 68 uh, in the later. Patients uh, underwent preoperative assessment and optimization for institutional protocol for a variety of different comorbidities listed here. here. You can see the differences in techniques between the two cohorts. With the first cohort using multiple different chemotherapeutic agents, including cisplatin, melphalan, and 5-FU, while the second cohort utilized melphalan exclusively. The duration of perfusion also varied in the first cohort from about three quarters of an hour to one and three quarters hour in the first group, while the second group uniformly underwent a one hour perfusion time. The temperatures also varied in the first group from 38 to 41 degrees with an average of 39 and a half, while the second group had a range of 38 to 42 with an average of 41.4, though the median and majority of these patients underwent a perfusion at 42 degrees Celsius. Another major change after in the later cohort was the standardization of the management of lymph node basin. This, after this time point, patients who did not have clinically evident disease and had not previously undergone lymph node surgery underwent sentinel lymph node biopsy only, as opposed to a formal lymphadenectomy. For patients being treated for melanoma, the three-year overall survival for patients undergoing the lymph perfusion after 2013 was significantly improved at 55% compared to those who underwent the procedure prior to 2013 at 35%. There's a similar significant difference in five-year overall survival at 21.74% for the earlier cohort and 26.67% for the later cohort. There's no difference noted in disease-free survival for patients who went limb perfusion prior to 2013 when compared to later than 2013 at both the three and five-year time points, though there was a trend toward improvement. Over the course of the institutional experience, there was a significant decrease in the length of hospital stay by decade likely due to the standardization of the techniques being used during the procedure and a dedicated cohort of experts performing these procedures, allowing for a more uniform approach to the care of the patients postoperatively. As the comfort level with the postoperative care grew, overall length of stay was able to be continually and safely shortened from the 1980s until the present day, with many patients able to discharge almost immediately following their observation in the ICU in the later decades. We also looked at 30-day complication rates and found that the majority were attributed to the lymph node removal portion of the treatment, such as surgical site infections, wound dehiscence, and DVTs, though there were also events unique to regional chemotherapy and the need for vascular access, including arterial dissection, neutropenia, and thrombocytopenia. It's also interesting to note there was a significant difference in complication rates for patients who underwent a groin lymphadenectomy at 40%, compared to no events for those uh, who underwent a simple lymph node biopsy alone. Our experience with lymph perfusion over the past four decades demonstrated a significant increase in overall survival for patients with melanoma, as well as a trend towards improvement in disease-free survival. While the specific cause of the improvement in overall survival was difficult to ascertain, we speculate that contributing factors include standardization of techniques and post-operative care, including chemotherapy drug choice, temperature of perfusion, and duration of perfusion. 
In the earlier cohort, there are multiple different drugs, as well as a wide range of temperatures and durations selected. But by 2013, the majority were performed with Melplan for one hour at 42 degrees Celsius, which may have played a role in these improved outcomes. Also of note, over the course of the experience, there was a significant decrease in the length of hospital stay by a decade, with standardization of techniques used during the procedure, as well as a particular uh, dedicated cohort of experts performing these procedures, allowing for a more uniform approach to the care of the patients postoperatively. As a level of comfort with postoperative care grew, overall length of stay was able to be continually and safely shortened from the 1980s until the present day, with many patients able to discharge almost immediately following their observation in the ICU in the later decades. The complications that were seen in our study were both secondary to the lymphadenectomy commonly performed for lymph node metastasis, as well as the chemotherapy. While 30, a 40% complication rate may seem a little high for patients undergoing groin lymphadenectomy, it's actually a bit lower than other prospectively collected single institution series and the remainder of the complications are consistent uh, with the regional chemotherapy side effects uh, observed in the literature. One of the limitations of this study is the limited data available for the earlier cohort. Without demographic data and data on comorbidities, it's difficult to determine if the two groups being compared are similar. There were no major changes in the criteria for eligibility for limb perfusion over the time period from 1980 to 2021. So it's reasonable to believe that the two groups are similar in makeup. However, this cannot be concluded with certainty. Additionally, due to the study design, it's challenging to draw conclusions about the causation and the improvements noted of overall survival and disease-free survival, as well as the decrease in length of stay. Standardization of the surgical approach in perioperative care, along with the introduction of effective systemic therapies, may have contributed to the improvements seen in outcomes, while at the same time markedly decreasing the length of hospital stay safely. The results of our experience suggest a continued utility of regional chemotherapy in combination with effective systemic therapy for the treatment of advanced malignancies confined to extremity and ongoing benefit of limb perfusion in an era of systemic chemotherapy. We'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Right, the discussant, invited discussant for this paper is uh, Dr. Finlayson from the University of Utah, and he's unable to be here, so I'll be reading his comments today. First of all, thank you to the authors for the work they have done to collect their treatment results and for analyzing and reporting them. It is a privilege to be asked to comment on this report, and I regret being unable to comment in person at this time. The study, while thorough, and its reporting is limited primarily by one, the absence of comorbidity and demographic data from the earlier cohort that would typically be used to adjust for differences between the two cohorts being compared, two, the relatively small number of cases that limit statistical power, and three, the changes over time in both limb perfusion methods and systemic therapies that also affect survival. These limitations prevent the authors from drawing any strong conclusions regarding the magnitude of any increase in benefit of hyperthermic isolated limb perfusion over time. Nevertheless, their report suggests that the field is advancing and serves as a reminder of the importance of prospective data collection and hopefully the creation of multi-center registries and treatment standards that would help answer the question of how beneficial limb perfusion is for this patient population. I have three questions to pose to the authors. In light of the substantial difference in disease-free survival between the cohorts without the achievement of statistical significance in the data analysis, did you or could you perform a power analysis beforehand to estimate the size of the difference that the study would be able to show? It would appear that there uh, was not enough statistical power to show even a very large absolute difference at the p-value of 0 0.05 threshold. Go ahead, you can go ahead and answer the first question. Sure. So uh, we did not perform the, the before or after to look for those. Um, since we were basically analyzing the experience over time, um, we were working with the data that we had and uh, we're really looking to uh, really more, I guess, pleasantly surprised at those increases in uh, disease-free survival and overall survival um, with the goal of examining the um, improvements in technique and how those related to um, safety and efficacy in the use of lymph perfusion. Um, with, uh, with the different inability to examine the uh, two groups in terms of their comorbidities and uh, basically confirm that they're two similar groups, 
um, we did not feel that it was the, it was looking for those changes statistically was going to be uh, our primary goal. Okay, very good. And number two, uh, are there multi center registries in place, or is there any opportunity to create such uh, such in order to get around the significant sample size limitations. You know, I would have to get back to you on that one. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. The uh, prospectively collected database, so the second half of our cohort that we were we were able to get all of our um, the most of our data from was established in order to try and address that at least within our own institution. But, but I don't know uh, personally if those other multi center groups exist. Okay, and the third question is kind of a compound question. So. In view of the fact that there has not been a compartment syndrome complication of hyperthermic isolated limb perfusion at, at Nebraska in the last nine years, is there an opportunity to avoid burdening patients and payers with the high cost of ICU care in the post-operative setting? Are there lesser alternative neurovascular monitoring methods that would be instituted outside the ICU? I think he meant at Kansas, but. Yeah, uh, so, uh, it is one of the more concerning complications and theoretical complications. Um, I don't know that uh, at all institutions it would necessarily require an ICU stay, but just the way that our units are set up at the University of Kansas, uh, there is no uh, step down unit they could go to to avoid a st spending time in the ICU if we were to get those Q1 hour neurovascular checks. Um, but at institutions where such a, uh, such a unit existed, I think that it, it would be reasonable to avoid an ICU stay and go directly to those step-down units. Okay, very good. Do we have any questions from the floor? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next paper, the progression of pseudomyxoma peritonei in patients with incidentally discovered low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasms at the time of appendectomy, will pre be presented by Dr. Rog from Swedish Medical Center. Thanks very much for that intro, and thanks for the Congress for allowing us to present our data here. Uh, my name is Colin Rog. I'm a general surgery resident at Swedish Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. And I will be discussing progression to pseudomyxoma in patients with low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasms discovered at the time of appendectomy. I have no disclosures. So historically, appendiceal tumors were thought to be really quite rare, maybe one to two percent of all appendectomy sp uh, specimens. But recent literature suggests that they may be more common than we once thought. Uh, some series, uh, particularly interval appendectomy following uh, episodes of acute complicated appendicitis, report tumor findings up to 10 to 30% of the time. Low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm, or what I'll refer to from here on out as LAMN, is one of those tumors, uh, depending on the series that you look, maybe 30 to 40% of the time. These are mucin-producing lesions with cytologic atypia, but no features of invasive infiltration. They do, however, demonstrate a sort of pushing invasion uh, with dissection of acellular mucin and or mucin's epithelium through the wall of the appendix, which can progress to pseudomyxoma peritonei, or what I'll refer to as PMP. And although progression to PMP leads to increased morbidity in this patient population, how often it occurs and what factors convey an increased risk are not well known or well documented in the literature to date. So we designed a retrospective study to try to answer some of these questions. Uh, we looked at all patients that were referred to our single quaternary care uh, cancer center for the management of appendiceal neoplasm over a four-year period, and then patients with LAMN confined to the appendix, meaning had not progressed yet, were identified. Patient demographics, tumor features, surveillance strategies, and outcomes were recorded, and then we analyzed the data. The statistics we used were pretty simple. Students t-test for linear variables, chi-square for categorical variables, and we utilized the p-value of uh, less than 0 0.05 for statistical significance. So in total, we reviewed 150 patient records. We found 30 patients with LAMN confined to the appendix uh, that was found after an appendectomy. Patients' uh, average age was 54, most were female, 73%, and most were referred to us from outside facilities, about 80%. On the right is just a breakdown of why these patients had appendectomy, half of them for acute uncomplicated appendicitis, another pretty solid chunk for acute complicated appendicitis, um, some of those were interval appendectomies, and then a few more during surgery for another indication or for chronic appendicitis. 
When we reviewed the pathology reports, we found these tumor features. Four patients, or 13%, had a positive proximal appendiceal margin, three with acellular mucin, one with mucinous epithelium. 21, or 70%, demonstrated appendiceal perforation. 28, or 93%, quite high in the series, demonstrated evidence of serosal extra appendiceal acellular mucin. And then another six patients, 20%, demonstrated evidence of serosal extra appendiceal mucinous epithelium. All patients underwent serial cross-sectional imaging by either CT or MR at intervals ranging from every three to 12 months at the discretion of the treating surgical oncologist. And these were our outcomes results. So six patients, 20% progressed to PMP in just about a year, 12.4 um, uh, months mean. Four of those patients uh, ended up undergoing cytoreductive surgery or debulking with HIPEC. And two of those patients remain in active surveillance just because they're minimally symptomatic at this time. Uh, we did not observe any deaths in our series. And as you can see here on the right, uh, demographic variables such as age and gender, uh, as well as tumor features such as positive proximal margin percentage, appendiceal perforation percentage, or the presence of either serosal extra appendiceal acellular mucin or mucinous epithelium did not differ significantly be between the patients who progressed to PMP and those who didn't. So in the few small uh, similar retrospective series that have been published in the literature to date about this topic, about zero to 23% rates of progression have been reported and we fell kind of on the higher end of that spectrum. Um, also, uh, currently there are no consensus guidelines regarding the method frequency or total duration of surveillance after the discovery of LAMN um, following appendectomy. Uh, we use surveillance imaging, cross-sectional imaging in our institution, but tumor markers and laparoscopy has, have also been reported from other institutions. I will say there is some data to suggest that if a patient will progress to PMP, they will probably do so in about a two year time frame. Um, and similar to our results uh, in the literature to date, there really are no demographic variables or tumor features that have been found to be predictive of, of progression. So while rare, the discovery of LAMN following appendectomy is a clinical scenario that all general surgeons, really regardless of practice setting, are likely to encounter. 20% of patients with LAMN confined to the appendix progress to PMP in an average of about one year in this small series. We also found that it's very difficult to predict which patients in this population will progress using demographic or tumor features. Um, but given the impact that progression has on morbidity, uh, we do recommend serial cross-sectional imaging for surveillance. Thank you. Thank you. The invited discussant for this paper is Dr. Sean Lagenfeld from the University of Nebraska. Move the microphone down. Thanks to the Southwest Surgical Congress for the invitation to discuss the study. Congrats to your team on a well executed retrospective review. You guys did a great job. I think it's relevant, as you said, to pretty much anybody that takes out appendices uh, because incidental neoplasms are common. And the burden of management usually falls on the surgeon. So just summarizing what you already said, the study demonstrates the progression to pseudomyxoma occurs in 20% of patients, usually at about the year mark. And you also sort of suggest that non-invasive imaging is an effective uh, surveillance strategy, which is sort of new data to my knowledge. So I have uh, three questions. First one, you sort of addressed a little bit, but maybe need to elaborate more. And that's that your medium follow-up was 18 months. You didn't use diagnostic glass paroscopy, even a lot of people do, as a means of surveillance. Do you feel that the method and duration of surveillance is adequate to capture all of the disease progression or could your number be even higher? You know, and number two, all case series for rare diagnosis are small, but an overall number of 30 is still pretty modest. And so considering that you did not find progression to be associated with things like perforation, positive margins, extra penicillin mucin, things we typically think cause that, is it possible you're dealing with a type two error there? And then the final question, compared to other case series, your cohort had a pretty, pretty advanced disease. 70% had perforation, 93% extra penicillin mucin. As you said, many of these were referred to you from the outside because you have unique expertise at your institution. Is it possible that the high rate of disease progression is related to sample bias? Maybe some of these less aggressive lamins with a lower risk of progression never really made it to your institution. 
So again, congratulations on excellent study. I'm glad the center such as yours exists to provide guidance to the management of these uncommon potentially deadly diagnoses. Thank you. Thank you very much for those questions and thanks for serving as the discussant for this abstract. Um, in regards to the first question about sort of the most uh, ideal method of surveillance, um, I think the data that we have probably suggests that laparoscopy is the most sensitive method of surveillance, meaning that when you do a laparoscopy, you're more likely to find patients earlier in the progression process. Um, for example, in one series, I think it was in 2016 or so, they found that in something like 80% of patients with uh, evidence of progression on laparoscopy, they had no evidence of progression on cross-sectional imaging. So I think that um, that probably speaks to the fact that laparoscopy is probably the, the most sensitive, meaning you'll find those patients earlier. Uh, at our institution, we continue to use cross-sectional imaging because we just haven't shown that using a laparoscopy would help us change management of those patients. Laparoscopy is also the most invasive and the most expensive surveillance technique too. Um, and really the benefit of such a big surgery like debulking and HIPEC in the setting of even at a high volume institution, um, having pretty high morbidity of that operation as well, really the benefit of that operation occurs once the patients become symptomatic. And so we found that the, um, the point at which the patient becomes symptomatic and the point at which that disease pops up on CT or MR, those kind of occur at the same time point. So that's why we're choosing to use surveillance. But I absolutely agree with you that I think we're probably missing some of these patients who just are progressing earlier because we're not using laparoscopy. Sure. Um, and then also kind of in regards to our, our follow-up period of, of 18 months, I think that's really our greatest weakness in this series. Um, you know, kind of as I spoke to before, there's very good data to suggest that if patients progress, they're going to do so in, in probably that two-year period. And we didn't get there. We didn't get to 24 months. We only got to 18. So type 2 error, I think missing some of those patients in terms of follow-up is, is also a very distinct possibility in the series. Um, to speak to that, I would say that, you know, we just don't have the, the data yet. The two oncologists that treat these diseases have only been in our institution and busy for about four years. So we just don't have the, the time frame yet. We will, we're continuing to follow those patients and that's exactly why. Sure. Um, for the third question about the sample bias, you know, I think that whenever you're at a, um, you know, high volume referral center where you're seeing these rare diseases and sort of everything is getting referred in and you're seeing only a handful of these patients, you know, um, definitely sample bias is always a possibility. Um, to speak to that, what I would say is that um, during the time frame that this data uh, was collected, we were the only HIPEC center in the region. So we did get referrals from university centers and we were also getting referrals too from, you know, small county hospitals, you know, rural hospitals, places up in, you know, it's, 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 we were talking about rural surgery earlier, you know, we, we frequently get patients from here, from Alaska, you know, from, from patient, you know, all these different states, they get referred to us. Um, so I think that um, certainly it's a possibility that we have some sample bias, but I'll say that I think that our sample is probably about as varied as, you know, we could possibly get. That's good enough for me. Thanks. Thank you. I have one question along those lines. So you say you have a broad referral area. Did they all come back to your institution for their cross-sectional images or if they, did they have their cross-sectional imaging at other places and were they similar protocols? Um, yes, ma'am. So, um, it, it varied by patient. Um, again, we do have a, a very large proponent of our patient population that comes from outside of the, the area where we serve. Um, so certainly a lot of the patients came to us and a lot of our patients went to, you know, get their imaging at an imaging center closer to home. But our electronic medical record within our, our institution is actually built to include all those patients. So we were able to include all of those scans. And especially with, um, you know, one of the I guess kind of silver linings of the COVID pandemic is that we've become a lot better at following these patients with like a video type of visit. Um, and so, you know, us being able to scroll through their CT and then talk to them when they're on their couch up in Alaska has really helped us to, to keep these patients in our series and follow them pretty, pretty regularly. Great, thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Oh, we have Hello. a question. Um, just a quick question, Colin, very nice presentation. I enjoyed it. Um, now, I noticed that you had a couple of patients that you are you're having on surveillance and waiting for them to become symptomatic before you hypec them. Um, what about doing a minimal invasive hypec on these patients? Are we sure that the biology is not going to change at some point because low-grade disease, it can be curable? 
And now more and more of us, as we do complex uh, cases on the robot, we even publish on a robotic HIPEC. So why, why not a minimal invasive uh, a HIPEC? And uh, what about the emotional distress of these people uh, having something that is growing in their, in their abdomen? Yes, thank sir. You thank you. Very nice presentation. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the practice at our institution, um, especially now that we have the Chicago consensus guidelines, which are only pretty recent for this particular um, neoplasm, um, our practice is to uh, offer these patients the surgery that will give them the most, the most benefit. And even at our institution, the morbidity of debulking and HIPEC is pretty high. Uh, and so just what we found sort of anecdotally, and I realize there's, you know, really no data behind this at all is that the, the patients, you know, the benefit of that surgery, we really find that benefit once the patients are already symptomatic. Um, and so that's why we're, we're choosing to follow those patients. I think it's a risk benefit discussion that you have with the patient. I think your point about, you know, disease progression is definitely a very real one. Um, but talking to these patients about, you know, hey, we're gonna do this big surgery to debulk you and strip your peritoneum and put HIPEC in. Um, you know, this is a very risky operation and you're not very symptomatic right now. Do you want to go for this? Do you want to continue to be surveilled? Uh, I think it's a risk benefit discussion to have with the patient based on what we know now. Um, and then in terms of minimally invasive HIPEC, that's something that I'm really excited to learn more about, uh, hopefully in fellowship. We don't do that at our institution, but I think that that really changes the game too, um, because, you know, those patients, you know, in those very early disease progressive progression patients, if you're not doing a midline laparotomy and stripping everything and keeping them open for 12 hours and you're just putting a couple of cannulas in and running the, the fluid, I mean, the, I think the, the morbidity of that would be a lot less than a big open operation. All right, thank All you. All right, thank much. you. All right, now we have our final paper, paper of the session. Uh, should we use ejection fraction in surgical evaluation of biliary dyskinesia? Nicholas Herdlika from the University of Oklahoma. Thank you for that introduction. I, I'm the last, hopefully not the least of the presentations. Uh, so I'm Nick Herdlichka from the University of Oklahoma and this is our project. Uh, we have no relevant financial disclosures. So I want you to imagine your typical person coming in complaining of biliary colic. Uh, you order a complete blood count, a comprehensive metabolic panel, and most likely a right upper quadrant ultrasound. And all of those come back normal. Your labs are uh, stone cold normal and your ultrasound shows no evidence of stones, biliary sludge, uh, no inflammation. So you move on to a HIDA scan with CCK injection. So this slide talks a little bit about uh, the HIDA scan and it also shows some of the pitfalls of the HIDA scan as these people get radioactive tracer through their IV uptaken by the liver and then they have to wait for four hours before they get a CCK injection. At that time then they're run through a gamma camera to image the hepatobiliary system and show us that um, so our objective was to demonstrate uh, if the reproduction of symptoms during a HIDA scan, specifically the portion in which they got CCK injection, could be used as an adjunct to the current gold standard of treatment, which is running them through the HIDA scan and calculating their ejection fraction. We conducted a single institution retrospective chart review uh, of patients and our inclusion criteria included a normal complete blood count and normal CMPs, uh, specifically looking at their total bilirubin and their liver function tests, um, that, that which would indicate an ulterior pathology. And then most of our patients also had a ultrasound that showed no evidence of gallstone sludge or any other pathology. All of our patients then had a HIDA scan with CCK injection. We had two primary outcomes, the first being the, their ejection fraction, which was considered normal at 35% or greater, and then less than 35% was considered abnormal. We also evaluated for the subjective reproduction of symptoms during the CCK injection 
portion of the HIDA scan. And this was uh, um, calculated or charted by the radiologist during the HIDA scan. Our resolution of symptoms occurred at two time points. The, our initial time point was at two weeks post-op. Um, this was an in-clinic visit just after their procedure. And then our long-term follow-up point was at least 30 days after surgery. Um, most of these even occurred up to four years after surgery. And this was done by a phone call interview. So our data, we initially compared patients based on their ejection fraction and zooming in here, um, we uh, were monitoring whether their symptoms had improved at initial and long-term follow-up. And what we found was that there was no statistically different uh, difference in whether or not these patients had improvement in symptoms. Basically, that regardless of their ejection fraction, most people actually got better uh, whether or not they were had a normal or reduced ejection fraction. We then evaluated patients based on whether or not they had reproduction of symptoms during their HIDA scan. And similarly, zooming in here, we again saw no difference uh, in whether or not these patients improved, but we did notice that there was a slight uh, a benefit to actually just only doing the um, or only evaluating based on their reproduction of symptoms. So this led us to uh, conclude that reproduction of biliary symptoms with CCK injection is an as effective uh, standard in diagnosing biliary dyskinesia compared to the formal calculation of the ejection fraction through a HIDA scan. Some of our limitations were this was a single surgeon, single institution, and it was retrospective in nature. We also had a relatively small sample size of only 54 patients with a large loss of follow-up. Um, I don't think it's surprising that not many people wanted to answer a random phone call from a person to ask about their gallbladder pain, but uh, we did have some limitation in that. Uh, so our future direction would be to uh, have a larger multi-centered prospective randomized control trial in which patients were either randomized to undergo um, CCK injection alone or have the formal HIDA scan, and then we would compare their symptoms based uh, postoperatively based on that. Um, so going back to our uh, initial patient, um, when we have, this would allow us to, when we have that patient with biliary colic that comes in, it has completely normal labs and an unremarkable ultrasound. We could theoretically then give them an in-office injection of CCK, monitor for symptoms, and with the reproduction of symptoms, then offer them a cholecystectomy. This would virtually eliminate uh, a cost for them. For a HIDA scan is roughly $1,000 to $1,200. It would also eliminate the exposure to radiation as they have to lay under a gamma camera and have radiation injected into them. And then it's also a lengthy procedure as they, most patients have to be there for at least four hours while, they're, while the uh, radio tracer is injected and circulates through the liver. Thank you very much. I wanna thank um, Dr. Samara Lewis, who is our resident, uh, on this paper who couldn't be here and also Dr. Raines for um, all his help in preparing this presentation and, and project. Thank you. The invited discussant for this paper is Dr. Walter uh, L. Biffle from Scripps Clinical Medical Group. Unfortunately, he's unable to be here, so I'll be doing his uh, discussion for him. Um, he starts off by saying, I'd like to thank the program committee for the privilege of discussing this paper and to congratulate the authors on their work in this presentation. Uh, biliary dyskinesia is a frustrating and challenging problem, and the authors have offered a potential streamlined approach to its diagnosis. I won't rehash the paper or the results. I have three questions. First relates to the patient population and their diagnosis. It is my understanding that this is a diagnosis of exclusion with normal blood tests, ultrasonography, and possible upper endoscopy, endoscopic ultrasound, bile microscopy, and MRCP. Your workup seemed more limited. Some of your patients had normal LFTs and some had a CT, but not an ultrasound. 
based on the Rome 4 criteria, the low EF is supported but not diagnostic. How many actual diagnosis of biliary dyskinesia? And what were the indications for surgery in the others, such as patients with a normal EF and normal EF plus no pain with CCK? Yes. Well, thank you, Dr. Biffle, for, these, uh, for this question. Um, so some of our patients did have a CT rather than an ultrasound. Um, these patients were ones that came to our surgeon, likely from an outside source or coming through the ER, uh, in which no evidence of any pathology was identified. And therefore, he, the history and physical met the um, standards for likely gallbladder pathology. And so he proceeded with cholecystectomy uh, without actually having a formal um, ultrasound. The, uh, as far as those patients that have a normal um, ejection fraction and a normal, or uh, sorry, without reproduction of symptoms, um, these patients did have a further workup as um, without those two things, a lot of these patients were thought to have an ulterior pathology. Um, when nothing revealed itself, then we went ahead and offered them a cholecystectomy in that um, group as that was the likely uh, source of their pathology. The second question relates to the outcomes. Over half of your patients had chronic cholecystitis on pathologic examination and a few others had gallstones or uh, cholester cholesterolosis. Only 57 patients had either biliary dyskinesia, how does the pathology diagnose, a pathologist diagnose that, or no abnormalities on pathology. It seems to me that including those with stones or chronic cholecystitis in the analysis of post-operative outcomes skews the results in favor of successful outcomes. Also, the Vinstra study you referenced emphasized the importance of long-term follow-up greater than six months, but yours was much shorter. What do the outcomes look like if you only if you only include those 57 patients with the final diagnosis of biliary dyskinesia? That is also another good point. So um, on final pathology, we did have a significant number that had chronic cholecystitis. We included them in our uh, study as preoperatively, we didn't have any way of identifying whether they had chronic cholecystitis versus an actual functionality disorder of their gallbladder. So they were included. And I'm not sure if we were to remove them from our final study, how that would change the data, but that is definitely something that we will look into when we get back. Okay. And finally, regarding the conclusions, a paper by Pill et al. in 2018, uh, which he suggests referencing and discussing, reported to follow up after six months or longer of 474 patients who had cholecystectomy for biliary dyskinesia or related diagnoses. They, like you reported, that per reproduction of symptoms with a provocative CCK test was a better predictor of symptom resolution than ejection fraction. They reported that patients in all categories of ejection fraction had similar symptoms, symptom improvement rates after cholecystectomy, hypokinetic 83%, normokinetic 79%, and hyperkinetic 87%. On the other hand, the results after positive versus negative CCK provocation tests were 89% versus 59%. But if the CCK was negative and the ejection fraction was hyperkinetic, it was 100%. Parenthetically, according to a recent uh, review, half of the patients with hyperkinesis had chronic cholecystitis. So this may explain the good outcomes. A notable finding from your study and the pill study is that the lar a large majority of patients appeared to benefit from surgery. This begs the provocative question whether we need to be doing any of these testing these testings. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, so our study or our study is um, actually showed no difference in uh, whether or not these patients had improvement after um, after surgery. And so, like he said. If, they, if there's no difference based on ejection fraction or based on reproduction of symptoms with CCK, then likely there would be no need uh, for doing either of these. Um, we would like to go ahead and do a larger um, study actually comparing the two as we think that there might be a, a better 
uh, prognosticator in the reproduction of symptoms with CCK, but uh, at this point, we don't know that. And if, if that happens to turn out that it is neither useful, um, then history and physical alone would be our best uh, predictor of biliary dyskinesia in that. All right, Dr. Biffle finishes by um, congratulating you and we have some questions. Thank you, Julianne, being a member of Rochester. Um, so it's a very vexing topic in, indeed. And one of the things that we have noticed is that it matters how fast you inject the CCK. So can you tell us how fast the CCK was injected in your, in your um, study? Because I think even normal people can have symptoms with two, two minute injections versus the 45 minute infusion. Um, and that would be very important to uh, consider as well. Right, thank you so much for that question. Um, unfortunately, I don't know the answer uh, as to what time frame or length of time that the CCK was given. Uh, I know that it was given after a few hours after the radio tracer was given, but as, as far as the injection length, I'm not sure of, but that would be something that we'd consider in our uh, longer term study and talking with our radiologists as well as making a actual protocol for having a set time frame over which that CCK was given. I'm just going to be devil's advocate to Dr. Biffle, who said, do we need to do any of these studies and say that the United States is one of the few countries in the world that takes out gallbladders that don't have stones in them. <laughs> so again, do we need, but from the other side, do we need to be doing any of these studies if you do an ultrasound and they have no gallstones? Sorry, I'm... In the United States, we're one of the few countries that take out gallbladders that have no stones in them. So from the reverse side of what Dr. Biffle asked in his last question, do we need to be doing any of these studies if we no, they don't have cholelithiasis. Mm. It's a tricky question. Good, good question. <laughs> I don't know that I have the answer to that either, but um, as far as what we've seen, most patients, even without evidence of gallstones or anything, have symptom improvement after um, surgery. And so that I think helps us, helps lead us to believe that there is actually something going on there. Okay, thank you very much. Brandon Grover out of La Crosse, oh, Wisconsin. One more, sorry. Um, just real quick, in our institution, they started reporting on biliary hyperkinesia. And um, did you include that as like a, in the, your dyskinesia cohort or was it just the low EF or did you include a high EF too? So we only looked at the low EF. Um, I know in Dr. Biffle's uh, question as well, um, he looked at the pill study from 2018 in which uh, patients were categorized into hyper normokinetic or low uh, hypokinetic. Um, we unfortunately only looked at the low ejection fraction, um, but that would also be a good topic to look at in our, in our future. Thank you. Thank you. So that ends uh, this session, and we are going to move right into the uh, um, Claude Organ uh, Memorial Lecture.